Coming up on American Black Journal, a new documentary about Detroit's remarkable jazz legacy is premiering at the Freep Film Festival. We're going to talk with one of the film's producers. Plus, a new exhibition here at the Detroit Institute of Arts pays tribute to African-American filmmakers and actors from the early days of cinema. Don't go anywhere. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bear paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm your host, Stephen Henderson. We're at the Detroit Film Theater here inside of the Detroit Institute of Arts. This is where the 11th annual Freep Film Festival is gonna kick off on April 10th. The festival is produced by the Detroit Free Press and more than 20 feature length documentaries and dozens of short films will have screenings over the course of five days at various locations in the city and suburbs. One of the documentaries making its world premiere is The Best of the Best, Jazz from Detroit. It tells the story of Detroit's innovative and influential jazz musicians. Here's a clip from the film, followed by my conversation with the documentary's co-producer and writer, Mark Stryker. It's about the meaning of music and jazz and the power of mu music and jazz. Because a lot of times with our formal education in school, we're focused mostly on notes. But we never really examine like the emotional aspects of music, the social aspects of music. One, two, one. Let's do it. In Detroit, you are instilled with this idea that that is a part of your mission to mentor other folks from the time you first play, start playing. It is like the, the, the each one teach one philosophy is instilled in you by the time you're 15 years old. How I choose folks to be mentored is sometimes I see the potential that this person can be a leader. So I wanna mentor folks that are gonna mentor folks. Mark, welcome to American Black Journal. Thanks, it's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's really great to have you here. Uh, you have been working on this material now, I think for five or six, maybe almost 10 years, is that right? Well, you know, the book Jazz from Detroit came yeah. out in 2019. I okay. was 56 years old when the book came out. <laughs> and I like, people would ask, how long did it take you to write the book? And I'd like to say, well, 56 years. <laughs> yeah, that's right, all 56. Uh, but, um, you know, once the book was out there, uh, um, you know, a, a year later, um, right before the world shut down in March yeah. of 2020, yeah. I went to Urbana, Illinois to give a couple of talks about my book. Mm -hmm. And I went to school at the University of Illinois, so there were a lot of old friends there. I was dinner one night with some of them, and w the, one of them said, you know, have you ever thought about making a documentary out of your book? And I said, no, but that's a really great idea. <laughs> and she said, well, look, I have these friends. They're in New York. They're filmmakers. And uh, that's what they do. Yeah. And um, so she connected us. And um, Daniel Lowenthal, Roberta Friedman, they are New York-based filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And um, they have deep experience in the documentary world and in uh, the commercial world. Dan has, is the director and the editor of the film, and he's edited 20, 35, 40 uh, Hollywood features, and yeah. he's uh, directed the last film that he and Roberta did together were, uh, was it 
what's called the Power to Heal, uh, Medicare and the Civil Rights Revolution that ran all over the country on PBS. Mm -hmm. And um, and Roberta is a, is a, uh, um, a producer and, uh, and a filmmaker, and she, um, she worked on Star Wars, the original Star yeah, Wars. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, deep experience. They love Detroit. They both uh, love jazz, and we started talking, and four years later, here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, the book, of course, focuses on the, the special role, I think, that Detroit plays in the history of jazz. Talk, talk about how that gets enhanced um, through a documentary rather than a book. Well, um, it's, it's actually been amazing to watch this sort of transformation of some of this material okay. into a new form and okay. to learn, uh, because I don't know anything about, didn't know anything about filmmaking, yeah. now I do, yeah. <laughs> after um, seeing how that material can transform and really deepen and become a much richer experience in many ways for an audience. So, for instance, in the book, uh, is organized by these biographical chapters mm -hmm. that highlight the contributions of these defining jazz musicians from Detroit. And you know, you can't tell everybody's story in a documentary film. And so what has happened in the film is that Detroit itself has become a much richer and deeper character. And we have embedded the history of jazz from Detroit and the stories of these great musicians within the rise and fall and hopefully rise again of Detroit's uh, economic, social, cultural trajectory yeah. uh, as an industrial power and the um, trials and, and triumphs of the African-American community in Detroit. So right. that material, which exists in some fashion in my book kind of throughout, is really foregrounded in the uh, documentary film. And so uh, we do tell the story of, of many important Detroit jazz musicians. We, we follow them from Detroit to New York, mm -hmm. and we see them um, influencing the, the rest of the world. Can't tell the history of jazz without also telling the history of jazz from Detroit. Sure. Uh, that's a big part of the film, but also um, the story of, of Detroit and the conditions here that created this explosion of jazz in the middle of the 20th century and then sustained it all uh, for the last 50, 60 years. Yeah. We keep producing great jazz musicians here, yes. punching way above our weight class. And so what I like to say, and I think what the film does very well, is it, it, it shows you that what happened in Detroit was not an accident. It was the result of particular social conditions, mm -hmm. but uh, a, a particular community um, and a variety of things that, and particular people, and all of that sort of comes together. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it's not terribly surprising because, I mean, this is a community that, in terms of creation and creative energy, we have it in lots of different places, right? I mean, so why not jazz is almost is almost the right question. Yes, and and. Um, and the, and the answer to the question of, of when you go deeper and you say, well, why Detroit? Yeah. You know, that's a story that starts with the Great Migration that yeah. brings, <laughs> you know, hundreds of thousands of African Americans yeah. to the north to Detroit in the first half of the 20th century. And it's the story of, um, you know, jazz is, is an expression of African American culture, yes. right? It's, it's a music of, um, of improvisation, of adapting one's life to uh, ever shifting conditions, that is the African American experience. Yeah. And you see, you see that play out, um, I think, in our film. Um, you know, the, the Great Migration brings all of these folks to the north. The auto they're attracted by the auto industry, um, which is offering some of the best wages in the country yeah. uh, for African Americans. It builds a black working and middle class in Detroit. Um, that economic vitality creates the neighborhood of uh, Paradise Valley, which yeah. is the economic and uh, business center of black Detroit in the middle of the 20th century. All those clubs, hotels, bars, opportunities for, um, uh, for musicians. Um, and lay on top of that things like uh, the Detroit Public Schools, yeah. some of the best music programs in the country, uh, particularly at places like Cast like Tech. Cass, yeah. Cass was integrated, uh, so black kids got the same opportunities there. It's no surprise that Donald Byrd mm -hmm. and Paul Chambers and Ron Carter, mm -hmm. uh, 
all came out of, and many, many others, all came out of Cast Tech in the 1950s. And much later, Jerry Allen mm -hmm. uh, comes out of Cast Tech. So um, you lay all that together, and then you lay on top of that um, mentorship, which yeah. is a huge theme in our film. And in the 1950s, uh, Barry Harris, a great pianist, is the sort of professor of bebop, and he's training everybody that comes out of here. And um, he sort of builds the DNA of mentorship into Detroit jazz. That baton gets picked up generations later by Marcus Belgrave, right. the trumpet player, right. and today that baton is being carried by uh, uh, the bassist Rodney Whitaker, who's sort of the mentor in chief. We followed those three stories through the film. Mm -hmm. So all of those, the, these, these overlapping, interconnected um, conditions are yeah. very powerful a set of conditions that don't exist in other places. Yeah. So you go, why Detroit? Well, that's why. That's why, yeah, and you can feel it still. I mean, I went to see Herbie Hancock uh, recently, uh, who was playing with Terrence Blanchard, uh, and um, the, the, the atmosphere in the theater was, even Herbie acknowledged, like he was coming home. Um, it was as if he was a Detroiter, and he kept referencing that the whole time. And I keep, kept thinking, you know, I, you wouldn't necessarily see that every place else or not in the same way. No, you would not. I mean, listening to Detroit is very powerful because the, uh, in an audience like that, because jazz is still a, a, a social music yes. in Detroit. Yes. And it's still a vital part of African-American culture in Detroit. And we still have a large African-American population that comes out and hears the music. And when you're playing for an audience in Detroit, you know, you're playing with people that went to high school with Jerry <laughs> Allen or Bob Hurst, yeah. or, you know, their parents went to school with, um, with Milt Jackson's family or Tommy Flanagan's family, or they heard those guys coming up in Detroit. So it's, it's special. The Detroit audience, um, you know, in, in the film, uh, uh, a couple of people say this, uh, Don Was uh -huh. says it, um, that, you know, Detroit audiences, you can't Detroit audiences, right? Because <laughs> right. we, we know, we've, we've been there, we've seen it, it, we've heard it. <laughs> so people know when they come to Detroit, they got to really, uh, they they really got to bring it, and you can you can feel that. Um, uh, Terrence, uh, I should say too, Terrence Blanchard is in the film. Yeah. He's one of three sort of big name jazz musicians from outside of outside, Detroit. Yeah that act as sort of commentators. Pat Metheny is in the film, Terrence Blanchard is in the film, Christian McBride is in the film, all sort of paying homage to these great Detroiters that have uh, come from here and influenced uh, the course of jazz history. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the film is done and gonna premiere at the film festival. Is there more for this material in your future? <laughs> you got a book yeah, and a movie. A book and a movie, you know, I. It's, it's clear to me that the, the cultural soul yeah. of Detroit and the cultural soul in particularly of black Detroit has become a, a life's work for me. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I grew up as a jazz musician. I grew up uh, idolizing Detroiters uh, like Hank Thad and Elvin Jones yeah. Yeah. and, and, and um, Joe Henderson, the saxophone player, and Paul Chambers. These were all my heroes growing up. Charles McPherson, who's great in the film. Um, and. Uh, I've lived with their legacy for a long time, and I'm hoping that, uh, I, I don't know what's next yeah. in terms of um, this material for me, but I, I can't imagine leaving it behind for too long before yeah. returning to it in yeah. some way. Yeah. It's, it's a rich legacy to mine. Yeah. yeah, all right, well, congratulations on the film. We'll see it April 13th at, uh, at uh, the DFT. An exhibit honoring the legacy of African-American filmmakers and actors from the early years of cinema through the Civil Rights Movement is on display here at the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's called Regeneration Black Cinema 1898 to 1971. The name is inspired by the 1923 independent movie Regeneration, which featured an all-black Past. The exhibition traces the often untold story of African-American representation in cinema history and it brings to light lost or forgotten films, filmmakers, and performers. I sat down with DIA curator and head of the Center for African-American Art, Valerie Mercer, to find out more about this landmark exhibition. Valerie, welcome to American Black Journal. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have I'm you delighted. back. Delighted. Yeah, it's Good been a long time, right? Like it has. <laughs> um, so I love the idea of this exhibit. Uh, I want to start by having you talk about how you came up with the idea for this exhibit and why it's so important to tell this story. Well, it's a show that was uh, originally organized by the um, Academy Museum yeah. of Motion Pictures mm -hmm. in LA. It, it's not a, it doesn't, it's a muse smart museum, but it yeah. doesn't have a long history. Yeah. So, but we're probably the second venue, I think they opened the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's such a great idea. I've never seen an exhibition on film history. Yeah. But um, I love film always have, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> makes me happy, uh, <laughs> e even when they're sad stories, just, bit, I guess because I'm a curator, mm -hmm. you know, I just love visual stimulation, <laughs> <laughs> but when it's a good story too, it makes me very happy, so I'm so glad that we took the show, yeah. and you know, it's so rich in history, yes. um, it covers 1898 to 1971, and I'm sure a lot of people don't realize that there were black filmmakers back in that time. Yes, yes. You know, uh, up to, of course, the history really t today, you know, it goes beyond 71. Of course. But th this is a really good a coverage of um, the growth, the, the start, the development yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, and now there's more black filmmakers, yeah. which yeah. is wonderful. So, so uh, the time period where the exhibition starts, of course, is really different from where it ends up. Uh, sure. Let's talk about that kind of early period, which I think is less familiar to people. It, it, I'm sure it the, is. Than the more recent period. What was black filmmaking like uh, in the, at the turn of the last century? Sure, well, um, you'll even see in the exhibition there are race films, mm -hmm. and some of those, while there are black actors in it, and actually even black actors with um, black makeup on mm -hmm. because right. <laughs> that was somewhat almost like uh, uh, as odd as it sounds it kind of became a standard right because of white performers always use and the minstrel um, yeah. yeah but this is a uh, max factor yeah. <laughs> black <laughs> makeup yeah. and uh but that sort of came out of uh vaudeville mm -hmm. you know number mm -hmm. of the uh early performers um because some of them were in the Ziegfeld Follies, mm -hmm. and then from there, some of them became, you know, interested in acting in films. Uh, so, uh, like Burt Williams, some of the re really famous vaudeville stars. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful um, p film, a piece of, sort of a uh, segment, I think, of a film, or maybe it's a whole thing of, uh, uh, at the beginning of the show, okay. and, and it's, uh, gorgeous black mm -hmm. couple. They actually are vaudeville performers, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's, it, you know, so um, wonderful, wonderful, intimate um, mm -hmm. clip of this uh, young couple kind of flirting with each other and then they kiss, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I remember I was telling Elliot, I, I remember being really young and the first time I ever saw a black couple kissed on a big screen, mm -hmm. I remember, um, actually sinking down in my seat and feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> but th then very quickly I thought to myself, now why am I feeling uncomfortable? Right. And I thought, oh, cause I've never seen uh, black people kiss on a big screen. On the screen. Yeah, I've seen white couples. And then I thought, I've only seen my mom and dad kiss. <laughs> but then I kind of thought to myself, yeah, I just gotta get used to this. Mm -hmm. So then I sat up <laughs> and over the years I became used to it. Yeah. But I remember it was it was lovely, you know, it was I think it was like Sidney Poitier and Abby Lincoln, mm -hmm. uh, The Love of Ivy. Mm -hmm. And uh <laughs> but I loved it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But we all have those first um uh experiences. Right. especially certain generations, you know. Because I mean I remember the time when, when you saw um you know, an African American in a film you told everybody yeah. <laughs> because it was so rare. It was so unusual. Yeah. yeah, or if you saw them on TV, mm -hmm. everybody in the family c came to look at <laughs> that person. You know, so uh, but uh, yeah, some of the early uh, uh, clips are really, really wonderful because yeah. you, you know 
you see some of these uh, famous performers and learn uh, about them. There's also, of course, um, you know, we have, uh, I think, a poster showing um, uh, The Birth of a Nation, because mm -hmm. that was such a highly publicized yeah. film. And in a way, too, that was probably the first blockbuster in American film. Yeah. And Elliot always says uh, so many directors always, in a sense, are trying to live that down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tr trying to surpass it because mm -hmm. uh, it was so popular, you know. But of course, it was, um, uh, you know, um, white supremacist on steroids, sort of, yeah. you know, when you yeah. see the film. Yeah. I think it's an important film. I mean, I've actually seen it about three or four times. Mm -hmm. First time I saw it, I was really kind of like nervous and yeah. uncomfortable, but then I thought, you know, just got to get used to it because it's important to know. Yeah. And I think in that way it's really important because it had tremendous impact yeah. on in American culture. Yeah. Uh, talk about why it's important to have this exhibition here in Detroit and here at the oh. DIA. Yeah. Why? Where, where else would you have <laughs> Right? Where this else? Is, this is <laughs> the place yeah. uh, because we have such a wonderful history of showing film. I think the theater now is about... Uh, we're about 50 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, Elliot, of course, is still going strong, and mm -hmm. so are <laughs> other people who work with him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always tease him and say, I think most of the people who come to your programs are, belong to their sort of auxiliary. I said, I bet they don't even look at a program. Mm -hmm. They just trust you, and they just show they up. They show up. Because <laughs> they know you're going to show them something good. Yeah. I mean, I was so happy when I discovered it, because... I think when I was hired, I, I don't recall anybody mentioned it to me, but maybe after about a month, I discovered it on my own. And mm -hmm. I said to Elliot, um, you know, I was feeling homesick for New York, but once I discovered your theater and saw the programming, I thought, wow, this is just like being in New York. <laughs> and he said to me, that's the sweetest thing you could have told yeah. me. But I mean, it's so top notch, yeah. you know, because it's films from all over the world. Yeah. So this is the place to have this exhibit. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad we yeah. took and, it. And in Detroit, I think, the oh, yeah. story that the exhibition tells has special resonance. Oh yeah, well there are some people connected, in a sense, with the uh, uh, project who come from <laughs> New York. One of the curators, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Rhea Coombs, mm -hmm. you know, grew, grew up here. She, she was here, I think, opening night just said some wonderful things. She was almost getting choked up about her memories. Aww. But, you know, there's certain actors in the, um, uh, you know, some, some, some of the famous actors were yeah. actually born and raised here. Yeah. Then I guess went off to, you know, since Hollywood. <laughs> sure, yeah. But, uh, but we have, we have uh, young filmmakers here too, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we do. I, I know uh, not a lot of them, but a few of them have reached out to me, and especially around the time of uh, the opening of this. And, and some of them were here yeah. and said wonderful things about the show. They were yeah. really happy about it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it dovetails with the other work you do here. At oh, the Museum, oh, absolutely. Which That's is one. Terribly important, and, and I feel like has changed a lot over. Yes. Over the years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it really supports my work as a curator of uh, African American uh, visual arts. Yeah. Uh, I usually mostly, of course, work with paintings and sculpture mm -hmm. and drawings mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, but telling that history, which I felt was so important, because yeah. uh, we don't get that in school. I never, I never got that. What I learned, I really learned from my mom, mm -hmm. you know, about the history, because mm -hmm. she did know it, um, but a lot of things I did not know, and um, but I learned it from her, and then from friends over the years, and just reading, you know, yeah. and becoming more and more curious. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, that's why I, the, the, going into the exhibition makes me feel, you know, really happy, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's some painful aspects of history, but, a lot of it, I think, does bring joy to most of us. To, you know, to see all these wonderful, creative yeah. uh, individuals and learn about them. I mean, some of the directors, um, you know, like Oscar Michaud, mm -hmm. um, going practically door to door, mm -hmm. he was so uh, 
in a sense, dedicated, but early on, wasn't like he had a lot of people working for him, but he learned how to make films on his own. Yeah. And he, he did it kind of step by step, and then, uh, yeah, wrote, a, wrote novels, turned them into movies, but with the novels too, he go to door to door, he's yeah, telling right. them, yeah. and then the same thing <laughs> with the film. You know, but, it, you know, these are wonderful inspirations, I think, for younger generation filmmakers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, well, uh, it's always great to see you. And same here. Yeah, and congratulations I, on the ex exhibition. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> still listening to you on the radio. Oh, well, as I, I appreciate that too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And thank you so much. Yeah. And you can see the Regeneration exhibit through June 23rd here at the DIA. That's going to do it for us this week. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org, and you can connect with us anytime on social media. Take care, and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you.